The city is awake. Across the length of its five boroughs, the vast stream of humanity will move. This was what a New Yorker's commute looked like in 1961. Can be seen the daily miracle that is the New York City but transit system. But that was then. Convinced. And this is now. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. Subway riders demanding an end to their commuting nightmare. So fed up of all the delays and cancellations that they are suing the MTA. New York subway now has the worst on-time performance of any major rapid transit system in the world and commuters are pissed. This woman's commute has gotten so bad she's considering leaving a job she really likes. No, I, uh, I got a new job. This rabbi was sent into a panic when his train stalled just before Shabbat. And then there's this guy who was stuck underground for so long, commuters saying to pass the time. God gonna make me lose my mind up in here. It's been two hours. They ended up making a Facebook group. They're still in touch. Yeah. The mornings where every single line is delayed feels like cruel or arbitrary. <laughs> but it really wasn't that long ago that New Yorkers would laugh at other city subway systems. Four lines in Boston, two in LA, that's cute. In New York, our trains run 24 7. We have 665 miles of track, 472 stations, 27 subway lines, and almost 6 million riders every single day. Does it really have to be this way? Also, has it always been this bad? Turns out, the MTA has recovered from a transit crisis before. These were the trains in the 1970s. Poor maintenance, high crime, and widespread graffiti. It was kind of scary. And that's Jim. He's been reporting on the subway since before I was born. He wrote the book about the subway, literally. In the 70s, it was really, really bad. Maintenance release had suffered. So officials poured money into the system, and it improved. They are working on it. They're doing the best they can. They're fixing the track. Well, they're too. fixing the track. They put in a new escalator downstairs. They improved it in the 80s. Today, we got better equipment, better parts, and better tools. 90s, it gets to be kind of the best it's ever been. The 1990s were the golden era of subway functionality. So if you want to prove to someone that New York has it all, just show them your Metro card goal. New York's governor at the time, George Pataki, called it a transit renaissance. But then that city that has, has it, all. it all started taking the system for granted. Starting with Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. Cut down the size of city government. Just a year into his first term, the mayor cut the city's contribution to the MTA's budget by millions of dollars. And then Governor Pataki followed Giuliani's lead. And so began a trend of mayors and governors diverting part of their budgets away from the MTA and toward their own priorities. And then blaming one another for the problems that followed. Right. So while the city and state contributions got smaller and smaller and smaller, Subway ridership went up, and so did the fares. But fares still weren't enough to make up for the budget cuts. So a group of Wall Street executives came to the MTA with a deal. These Wall Street execs, they went to the head of the MTA, also known as the governor, and said, give us your debt. We'll pay you cash. Pay us back later. Pataki agreed to the deal to refinance the MTA's debt. Basically, they used the Amex to pay off the MasterCard. And these bankers, many of whom were donors to Governor Pataki's campaign, walked away with $85 million in commissions and fees. And that debt lives on today. Finally reaches its destination. Even if some of the equipment we're still paying for it does not. Uh, great habitat enhancement for fish and shellfish. <laughs> Then, there was a fiscal crisis globally. That was a really big turning point for the MTA. Maintenance was withdrawn. If you're checking the cars less frequently, you're repairing the cars less frequently, then they're going to break down more frequently. So basically, the trains became slightly less reliable. But there were millions of dollars draining from the MTA's budget that could have been used for maintenance. So what happened was... This summer, Governor Cuomo's administration forced the MTA to bail out some upstate ski resorts after an unusually warm winter. So we set out to try and find out if there were a lot of other examples of the MTA being forced by the state to spend money on things that had nothing to do with the subway. And we found out about these bond issuance fees. 
fond issuance fees may sound a little boring. So I hired a busker to write a song about it. Where are the MGs underfunded and operating at a loss? And over half their capital budget is money they borrow by issuing bonds. And every time they issue a bond, they get charged a fee by the state. And it's state funding cuts that force them to issue the bonds in the first place. And in the last 15 years, the MTA has paid the state over $328 million in bond issuers fees. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me put it this way. The MTA brings in a lot of money. The state has used that money as a piggy bank for other priorities. The next stop is Fulton Street. Fulton Street was the pet project of a guy named Sheldon Silver. He wanted Fulton Street to be the Grand Central Station of downtown Manhattan. So construction started, the years went by, and the day of the grand opening arrived. Oh, gosh, we're way over budget. At this point, the MTA board wants to scale things back. And one of the board members, Nancy Cheval, wife of Paul McCartney, yeah, yeah, yeah. said, we're not building cathedrals here. But the next day, Sheldon Silver demanded, you are going to build this thing the way it was originally supposed to be built, or else I'm going to veto your capital budget. So the MTA complied. A billion and a half dollars on one station. We didn't get an extra subway car, an extra foot of track. Nothing. Did I say it was in his district? Fulton Street was just one example. These politicians really wanted to be able to have a big project. They could champion <laughs> mosaics and artwork and everything is brand Clean, new. Shiny subway station. <laughs> this is exciting, right? I did this for you. Here is my gift to you. Okay. Yeah, I feel good about yeah. that. Of course you should. You can't really do that with replacing some ancient subway signal system that people don't even know exists. No one wants to talk about the signals. I don't think I understand how the signals even work. And neither did I. So I watched a documentary released by the MTA to learn more. People know that the system is old, but I don't think they realize just how old it is. It's not just the architecture that's 100 years old. It's a lot of the basic technology as well. We never really know where the train is. Um. Yeah, the workers don't actually know where the trains are exactly, precisely on the tracks. They know what section they are in. So they have to keep them a safe distance apart as they go through the system. You can't just go to Best Buy and pick up something to replace this 1930s piece of equipment. New signals would mean more trains running more efficiently and closer together. But it's been two decades since the MTA first began its push to upgrade its signals. And so far, they've completed just one line. If you don't focus on the core needs of the system, bad things can happen. So the trains were not as well taken care of. The signal system deteriorated. And there was very little margin for error. And then that margin gets even smaller with Hurricane Sandy. The worst disaster in the history of the subway system. So this is the part of the story where all of those bad decisions of the past really start wreaking havoc. The MTA is openly violating its own safety directive. A tunnel wall in Brooklyn collapses onto the track. We just boarded the rescue train. There have been 22 derailments. Overcrowding is definitely a problem, but the MTA can't blame everything on overcrowding. The issue is there's not one person to blame. There's been a lot of back and forth between the governor and the mayor. Blame everybody who has been in power in New York in the past 25 years. A train careens off the tracks in Harlem, injuring 34 people. And in summer of 2017, the waiting and crowding and derailments reach a breaking point. And at long last, Governor Cuomo declares a state of emergency. I mean, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. No pun intended. <laughs> um, I actually did not intend that pun. You know, there are some signs that politicians are now taking the maintenance of the subway system seriously. Elected leaders are finally expected to come out with a plan to pay for the MTA. And I think there's a consensus they can't just rely on debt anymore. I believe in you, Subway. But you gotta get it together. We want to do this. We need to do this. We will do this. I think delays in a messed up way are a way to bring people together. <laughs> There's no New York City without the subways. I regard it as the great public commons of New York. 
Yeah, it was good. It was nice meeting all of you. Meeting. <laughs> they ride together, and in this journey can be seen the daily miracle that is the New York City transit system, upon which the very existence of the city and its people depend.